Ships, just like people, occasionally need a little makeover to stay fresh. But also just like people, sometimes those makeovers can go horribly, horribly wrong. Be it for reasons economical, unfortunate, or just outright disastrous. Today, let's run through five of my picks for the worst ship makeovers of all time. Number five, the SS America becomes the SS America again. When she was first introduced in 1939, the SS America was easily the most modern and stylish American built ship afloat. The Second World War interrupted what should have been a brilliant start to a career as an ocean liner, and the ship served as a troop ship, carrying thousands to the Pacific and European theaters of war, renamed USS West Point, and also sporting a groovy, dazzle camouflage paint scheme. At the end of the war, America was back in the ocean liner service, still a popular choice for travelers, but largely overshadowed by her much bigger running mate, the SS United States, by the 1950s. By the mid-1960s, the ship was a little tired, so the United States lines sold her to Chandra's Lines, a Greek company hoping to capitalize on the lucrative migrant trade between Europe and Australia. You see, Chandra's Lines were masters at buying aging, tired, retired ocean liners and refitting them as humble migrant ships, and they did this with the SS America, renaming her Australis and putting the already 24-year-old ship back into service for another 14 long years through the 1960s and 70s. While Chandra's line was a master at acquiring old vessels and putting them back into service, they were a little less adept at maintaining them, and the SS Australis started to look a little bit sad. In some voyages, the ship even developed a list or lean over to one side that wasn't really rectified for the rest of the voyage. By 1978, the liner had transported hundreds and thousands of families and was, simply put, run down. So Chandra's put the ship on the market and found a buyer in the form of Venture Cruise Line. Venture was a budget cruise line based out of New York that wanted to capitalize on nostalgia for the good old days of American ocean-going travel by running the ship on voyages to nowhere out of New York City. But unfortunately, the Australis, by this point, had been laid up for a prolonged period of time and was pretty filthy, crammed full of garbage, old and tattered furniture and carpets, overflowing sewage and broken piping. The ship was a bit of a mess, so Venture had a pretty big job on their hands of converting it back into a functioning cruise ship. But they got started. The first thing they did was give her her old name back, America. Then they painted over the Chandra's line colors and gave the ship a nice, patriotic red, white and blue paint scheme. And that was kind of it. So when passengers stepped aboard for the first time in June 1978, they were appalled to find piles of soiled laundry and linen, rats, broken toilets, piles of trash, and a terrible, terrible smell. America departed the port and started steaming down the Hudson River, but passengers actually mutinied at the horrendous conditions. The ship had only just passed the Statue of Liberty when the captain turned America back around and offloaded 960 of her passengers. Venture was hit with $2.5 million in claims from passengers, all future sailings were cancelled, and the company went bust. A US Public Health Service inspection rated the ship 6 out of a possible 100 points, and it was impounded and put up for sale again. She was bought, incredibly, by her old owner's Chandra's line for the princely sum of $1 million, having sold it to Venture for $6.5 million, and making themselves a nice $5.5 million profit while then getting their ship back in the process. Good one, Chandra's. Chandra's line being Chandra's line, they then refitted the ship a bit and put it back into service as the Italis, cutting off one of the funnels to make the ship, and I quote, more modern. This lasted for about a year before she was finally pulled from service for the last time and changed hands three or four times, first to become a prison ship, and then for scrap, and finally to become a floating hotel. The ship was to be towed to Thailand for this, but on the way she snapped the tow cables in a heavy sea and was hopelessly beached on the Canary Islands, where over the next few decades she slowly broke up and disappeared beneath the waves by as late as 2007. Number 4, the SS New Australia. In 1931, the Furness Bermuda Line had a bit of a problem when their star ocean liner, the MV Bermuda, caught on fire in an apparently empty cabin. The ship was mostly gutted, but saved narrowly from total destruction. The Hulk was then towed to Belfast to be rebuilt by her original builders, and when the ship was nearly complete in November of that year, it spontaneously burst into flames again, and was a complete loss. 
So the company decided to replace that liner with two sister ships named Monarch of Bermuda and Queen of Bermuda. And the two sisters were eye-achingly beautiful, extremely well proportioned, with three handsome funnels and lovely sweeping promenade decks. The ships were a little odd because they were designed to operate in the treacherous, strong currents around Bermuda, where tugs were a little bit of a rarity. Because of this, the ships were built with shortened bow and stern sections to reduce overall length and therefore the overall turning circle, and to improve handling they were given four propellers each. 1934, the SS Morrow Castle spectacularly caught on fire and burned, and it was actually the Monarch of Bermuda that was one of the ships to arrive on scene to help. But in 1947, after wartime service as a troop ship, it was actually Monarch of Bermuda's turn to follow the time-honoured Furnace Bermuda Line tradition and spontaneously burst into flames, and she did this well. The ship was almost totally gutted by fire at the wharf side. She was sold for scrap, but bought instead by the British Ministry of Transport, who had the somewhat insane idea of rescuing the empty, fire-damaged hulk and rebuilding it as a Spartan immigrant liner. What emerged from this scheme was the SS New Australia, a confused-looking squat ship with the beautiful hull of the Monarch of Bermuda, but not much else very beautiful about her. An entire deck of superstructure was removed, so the ship seemed oddly proportioned. The elegant bridge and superstructure front was lost and replaced with a blocky, square monstrosity. The huge split mast over the brutalist bridge was actually a funnel for the forward boiler rooms, and on the bow was the remains of the original foremast, cut down to a stub with derricks for moving cargo. All in all, the ship was a bit of an eyesore, but it didn't really matter because its role was purely utilitarian. Her operation was taken over by Shaw Saville Line on behalf of the British government for seven years. The ship was eventually sold to Greek Line, renamed Arcadia, and refitted for cruising. But in 1966, she was finally retired and scrapped. Number three, the MV Astoria. Now I know a few hardcore ocean liner nerds are probably going to be a little bit sad to see the Astoria in this list, but I just couldn't help it. The ship has one of the most fascinating and unlikely career histories of all time. She'd started out life as the beautiful Swedish America liner Stockholm. The ship was a real stunner, built in the tradition of other Swedish American line ships with beautifully curved bridge fronts, a gentle shear curving the bow and the stern of the ship up, and a single streamlined funnel. In 1956, Stockholm gained international notoriety when she rammed the Italian luxury liner Andrea Doria and sank her. In fact, the collision was so bad that Stockholm's bow was telescoped in and totally crushed, but the ship's watertight compartments held, and she was able to sail into New York under her own power. The bow was rebuilt in Swedish America, sold the ship to an East German company in 1960, who renamed her the, uh, the Volker Freud... Freundschaft. Volker Freundschaft. The Volker Freundschaft. Which really isn't a catchy name for non-German speakers. But anyway, the ship changed hands a couple of times into the 1980s, serving as a floating barracks at one point until 1989 when Star Lauro Line purchased her and intended to rebuild her as a cruise ship. She was towed to Genoa, which was coincidentally the Andrea Doria's home port, and totally gutted. Her funnel was stripped off so that new diesel engines could be put in, and everything about her external appearance was completely altered. The beautifully swept bridge front was replaced with a blocky angular thing instead. She received a pretty generic looking funnel and looked overall, upon completion, like many other small cruise ship. Except for this hideous ducktail sponson, which was kind of tacked onto the stern to aid in stability at sea. It's incredible that the Astoria is actually still sailing today, given that she was built all the way back in 1948. And while it's a nice fact, there's just simply no denying that she looked significantly better during her Swedish America Line days. Don't at me. Number two, the Costa Marina and the Costa Allegra. There's not really much to say about these ships, except they were just a little, a little ugly. The Axel Johnson class were a group of utilitarian container ships, designed and built in the late 1960s. Not exactly what comes to mind when you think of luxury cruising, but clearly the famous Costa Line didn't agree when they purchased two of these sister ships in 1988 and 1990. Their plan was to convert them, somehow, into cruise ships. And this they did. The result was the MV Costa Marina and the MV Costa Allegra. And bless them for trying, but from the outside at least, they just weren't very convincing looking cruise ships. The ships still had those utilitarian container ship lines, but now with a nice added fat blocky superstructure on top. Still they must have been nice on the inside, because the pair cruised all the way up until about 2013, before being retired and scrapped. 
Number one, the SS Hellenic Prince, one of my favorite passenger ships of all time. In the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, almost any ship that could float was mobilized and turned into an immigrant ocean liner to help evacuate the war's refugees. And I'm not exaggerating when I say almost everything that could float, because Greek-owned China Hellenic Lines purchased a retired Australian warship with the idea to somehow convert it into a passenger liner. That warship was the bizarre-looking HMAS Albatross, an Australian seaplane tender that was a veteran of the Second World War. China Hellenic Lines sent Albatross off to Wales in the United Kingdom, where she was overhauled and converted into service as a passenger ship. Would they rebuild the superstructure to make her look sleek and modern? Would they add comfortable amenities and stylish public rooms for passengers on board? No. No, they would not. Because the newly named SS Hellenic Prince left the shipyard looking almost exactly the same as she had when she arrived, save for more lifeboats. Now, I mentioned this ship on a live stream the other day, and somebody commented that it looks a little bit like a kitchen knife, and now I cannot unsee that. This tiny seaplane tender somehow now managed to squeeze 1,200 passengers Yes, 1,200 passengers, into sparse dormitories and bunk cabins throughout the ship. There were no lounges, and the only covered promenade deck was at the stern of the ship, which sat extremely low to the water, and therefore was often half submerged and totally unusable to passengers on the month-long voyage to Australia. Simply put, there was just not enough room, and the ship's decks were often crowded with hundreds of uncomfortable and unhappy passengers. Worst of all though, she was put under the command of a gruff Navy veteran by the name of P.C. King. Captain King actively held disdain for his passengers and became known as something of a tyrant. On the coming voyages to Australia, she lost an anchor and even broke down. The voyages to Australia were packed with refugees and poor immigrants, but the return voyages to the United Kingdom saw the ship totally empty because the onboard conditions were so bad that even budget tourists weren't interested. In 1951, things came to a head when Captain King accused his passengers of mutiny and poor behaviour in the ship's onboard newsletter, the delightfully named Kangaroo. In his statement, King made it clear that the passengers' behaviour this afternoon was an act of mutiny, and that, among other things, the names of agitators are known to me. Ooh, scary. You see, on that voyage, passengers had actually been required to help clean and maintain the ship. Some of them working in the mess rooms, cleaning dishes, and even helping out in the engine and boiler rooms, only to be paid in cigarettes. Drinking water largely ran out, fridges broke down so that fresh food rotted, and passengers were refused disembarkation at any of the visited ports on the way. And thanks to a ballast pump malfunction, the ship listed over the entire time, leading to outbreaks of seasickness. The whole thing was utterly miserable, and the passengers responded by protesting with a hunger strike, which King then attempted to break up by spraying them with cold seawater from a hose and issuing his statement in the Kangaroo newsletter. On arrival in Australia, word got out that something was seriously wrong, so Captain King was interviewed by a local West Australian newspaper. Ever the charmer, King said of his passengers, and this is a direct quote, their habits have been filthy and they were a constant worry to the crew. Some of them are not even white. I do not know who is responsible for the choice of migrants to Australia, but some of these passengers are poor types. Some appear to have the mentality of children. <sighs> what a lovely guy. Anyway, serious complaints were made by passengers. So serious that the International Refugee Organization just had to pay attention, and King and the Hellenic Prince's owners were censured. Hellenic Prince was retired and ended up at the scrapyard in Hong Kong in 1954. So there you go, five totally hopeless ship makeovers. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my picks in the comments below, and which of these ships you would be most willing to travel on if it came to it. I'm willing to bet it probably wouldn't be the Hellenic Prince. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like and subscribe to the channel. Every bit helps, and I put out a new video every week, so you'd hate to miss out. If you'd like to support my work, please subscribe to me on Patreon, or you can sign up for a YouTube membership for perks like early access, behind the scenes, and many more. You'll find the link in the description below. As always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.